Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from the book of Proverbs. We're going to be looking at chapter 3, a few verses there, and then some verses in chapter 8. Let us hear the word of God. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you, Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. Proverbs chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. Choose my instruction instead of silver, knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is more precious than rubies, and nothing you desire can compare with her. Verse 22. The Lord brought me forth as the first of his work before his deeds of old. I was formed long ages ago at the very beginning when the world came to be. When there were no watery depth, I was given birth. When there were no springs overflowing with water, before the mountains were settled in place, before the hills, I was given birth. Before he made the world or its fields or any of the dust of the earth, I was there when he set the heavens in place, when he marked out the horizons on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above and fixed securely the fountains of the deep. When he gave the sea its boundary so the water could not overstep his command, and when he marked out the foundations of the earth. Then I was constantly at his side. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence, rejoicing in his whole world, and delighting in mankind. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. Getting Divine Wisdom We live in a pluralistic society. That means individuals can decide what ethical beliefs, if any, they want to hold on to. So people are always arguing about morality. Just the other day, listening to CBC radio, I heard a case against legalization of prostitution. But there are a lot of people who would argue the very opposite. So there is lots of different moral standards. Everybody has a view on what is good and what is bad, what is right and what is wrong. However, as important and as crucial as these debates are, morality doesn't always address most of the situations you and I are faced with. Rules or morality, no matter what you think they are, the vast majority of life decisions and life situations we face aren't help by these rules. And we can mess, make a mess of our lives if we make the wrong decisions. We need something we, we hardly talk about today. We may talk about science and facts and information, and the moral community, like the church, likes to talk about what's right and wrong. But what we need to face life challenges is something that's hardly discussed at all, and that is wisdom. For a few weeks, in the uh, last few weeks and the next couple of months, Reverend Bob and I will be talking about wisdom. We've titled this sermon series, Getting a Grip on Life. Without wisdom, we can mess up our lives. Of course, Christianity does not have the corner on wisdom, but we have the person of wisdom. This morning, we're going to see why, as important as knowing what's right and wrong, we need wisdom. Proverbs chapter 8, verses 10 and 11 says this, Choose my instruction instead of silver, knowledge rather than choice gold, for wisdom is more precious than rubies, and nothing you desire can compare with her. Notice it compares wisdom to silver and gold and precious rubies. Wisdom is speaking and says, take me instead of silver. Choose me rather than gold. I'm better than any jewels. In fact, I don't even compare to all that you desire. Friends, if you had one wish, would you choose to be the richest person in the world? The most beautiful person in the world? 
or the wisest person in the world. Let's be honest here. Would you choose wisdom over riches and fame? The Bible tells us that wisdom is infinitely more important than all the wealth and all the fame of the world. It is far more, more, more important than the greatest of life circumstances because wisdom is the ability to handle and flourish in all life circumstances, whatever they might be. Having a great life circumstances like fame and fortune and power and happiness is nowhere as important as having wisdom. Wisdom is not the same as morality. It's not less than morality, but it's much more. It's also not the same thing as knowledge. For example, let's say you want to help a poor family out. That's good. That's right. It's a noble thing to do. But if you're not wise, you can be a hindrance to that family rather than a help. We need wisdom a lot more than anything else when trying to navigate through life. Sure, some decisions we make may only require knowledge. For example, if you had all the knowledge in the world about cars, you can probably choose the right car for yourself. Or if you had all the knowledge of medicine, you can write your own prescriptions and write your own treatment. However, the vast majority of the decisions that you and I actually have to make, rules and facts don't help. Like, who do you marry? Do I get married? What career should I go into? How do I raise my children? Should I confront this person or hold back? Should I take a risk or should I play it safe? A wrong decision in any of these questions can lead to heartache, disaster, or a lot of suffering. And yet there are no rules to follow. A lot of the pressure and stress we face is because we lack wisdom. That's the problem. Do you know someone who's wise? When you think about this person, would you say that they're able to handle life well? They have a level of competency in the way they handle life and all of its complexities. That's because wisdom is the ability to know what the right thing is to do in the 80% of life situations where moral rules don't apply. Sure, 20% of life decisions are about moral decisions. But the majority of life situations, you need more than rules. You need wisdom. In most of the difficult decisions that you and I have to face, the moral rules don't apply. So how do we get wisdom? First, think of wisdom not as a door, but as a path. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6, in the King James Version, which some of you prefer, it says, In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your what? Your path. He shall direct your path. Not only in chapters, in this, this chapter in Proverbs, but throughout the Bible, life is described as a path. More than 700 times in the Bible, living or living life is compared to walking along a path. For me, I thought wisdom was more like knowing which door to walk through. It's about decision-making, like we said earlier, right? So making the right decision in regards to life sounds like a door would be a better metaphor. However, getting wisdom is not about unlocking the right door. It's about walking one step at a time along this path of life. When you think about walking along a path, I think it's really boring. It's kind of mundane. It's repetitive, boring action. One step after another. But really, that's the only way you're going to do it. You're not going to make much progress if you start to somersault down the path or you start leaping down the path. You're not going to be able to keep that up. If you're going to go for miles and miles, it's going to be left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. One step in front of the other. Becoming a person of wisdom is basically a product of how you do the little things every day. Your little choices, your little attitudes, the basic disciplines, the things you spend time doing every day. It's not the dramatic events, it's not the life-changing things, it's the daily little things, one step at a time, that you become a person of wisdom. It's not a matter of finding the right door or getting the right key. It's not a happy, about having certain knowledge or experience. Wisdom is a path, not a door, in which we, you walk through step by step, and over a period of time, long period of time, we gain wisdom. 
And this is important for us to understand because we live in a culture with quick fixes. We want quick answers. In the past, historically, when people were faced with problems, they asked themselves, how can I change? What do I have to do to face this challenge? But now, when we're faced with problems or challenges, instead of asking, how can I change? We say, how can I change this situation? How can I change my circumstances? So the solution is to find a technique, finding the right door, the right key. If you walk into any bookstore like Indigo or Chapters, you'll find books after books after books that give you three lessons or five steps or ten CDs on how to overcome shyness, handle stress, how to overcome anxiety, how to have a decent love life, how to understand the opposite sex. In other words, the world tells us that wisdom is a door that you have to get through. It's learning new techniques so you can change your circumstances. But the Bible says wisdom is not a door, but it's a path where you walk along one step at a time. When I was younger and graduating university, I wanted to know God's will for my life. And what do you do with a question like that? Who do you go to? So I went to the pastor, and I said, Pastor, I want to know God's will for my life. You know, a lot of us go through this. There are times in our lives when we have to make big decisions like, what should I do with the rest of my life? Is it time to move or should I stay? Should I take this job or should I sell my home? There are times where we're going to try and discern God's will. There's a story of a man who wanted to go, know God's will for his life, so he prayed and he asked God to give him an answer and he took his Bible and he opened it up and pointed his finger down at the verse and it says, Judas went out and hung himself. <laughs> Not liking what he saw, he closed the Bible again and he opened it up and pointed his finger to another verse and it said, go and do likewise. He said, oh my goodness, this is just coincidence. I'm going to try it one more time. He closed his Bible and opened it up and says, what you're about to do, do quickly. <laughs> Thankfully, my pastor didn't advise me to do that. But you know what he did say? And this is going to be a surprise. He said this, Linda, God gave you a brain. Use it and make a decision. Stop sitting around trying to guess God's will. Here I was, trying to be totally spiritual about all this, and he said, use your brain, make a decision, stop sitting around. Was I really trying to be spiritual? Or was I just trying to look for the door, the right technique? You know, there are many people who say, you know, Linda, I've been a good person. I've lived morally, I go to church, I say my prayers, I read my Bible, but you know what? My life isn't turning out the way I want it. You know what this person has done? They've turned their life of moral living into a technique. They've turned prayer into a technique. The purpose of those things is to make you wise, not to change your life circumstances. So what are those daily disciplines, daily practices? What are the daily, repeated, steady things that we do to turn into a wise person? There are many disciplines, and I can, we can do a Bible a sermon series on that. But one of the best books is this Christian classic book. It's called Celebrations of Discipline by Richard Foster's. Now, how many of you have read this book? <laughs> Wonderful. And the only reason why I ask is because our Bible study group leaders have been studying this book for over a year. It's an excellent book about disciplines, and, and uh, so look into it. But the purpose of all these disciplines that are outlined there, the ultimate goal of some of these practices, which I'm just going to read, it says here, uh, meditation, prayer, fasting, studying, simplicity, discipline of solitude, submission, and service, and so forth. But the purpose of all these disciplines, the ultimate goal of these practices is, you know what? To get to God. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 3 says, Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Love and faithfulness are two Hebrew words that are always used of God. They describe a personal, intimate, covenant relationship with God. This word love or loyalty or mercy, as other translation has it, it's a word which means absolute commitment and unfailing love. 
It's God's love for you. He is absolutely committed to you under any and all circumstances. And so when it says, let love and faithfulness never leave you, bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of heart, your heart, the writer is being very practical. But this is not, very e not an easy thing to do. It's not enough just to know that God loves you. If you want to become wise, you've got to find ways to press deep into your heart every day that God is absolutely committed to you, that he would never leave you nor forsake you, that he will do anything for you. You have to remind yourself about it every day as you go about your day. Whether it's through meditation, prayer, fasting, worship, you have to find ways to make the unending love and faithfulness of God real to your heart. You have to daily put into your soul that He absolutely loves you. This is so important for wisdom. It's the primary thing. How many of you have asked this question? either to your spouse or maybe to your parents when you were a child. How many of you have ever asked, do you love me? Oh, okay, see, Dave, I'm not the only one. <laughs> Why do we ask that question? Because we need assurance. We need reminders. We need affirmation that we are loved. Now, if we need reminders from people around us, how much more we need the constant reminder that God loves us. This is not easy to do. But what if wisdom was a person? A person who you can know and love. And if you got into a relationship with this person, it made you wise. What if wisdom was a person who could be your best mentor, the best teacher, the best counselor, in John's gospel, John chapter 1, the gospel opens like this. It says, and it's very similar to Proverbs 8. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing has, that has been made. The word, the word word is logos in Greek. And it could also be translated as wisdom. So we can basically translate John chapter 1 as follows. In the beginning was the wisdom, and the wisdom was with God, and the wisdom was God, for nothing was made without him. And then further on, verse 14, and the wisdom of God became flesh and dwelled among us, and we beheld his glory. In other words, Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God. What is this path of wisdom? It's the path to Jesus. How do we press deep into our hearts that God is for us? Jesus Christ. Martin Luther, in one of his commentaries, wrote this. Jesus Christ has become wisdom for us, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. When asked if there's anything we need to do, Martin Luther said, no, nothing but to look to Jesus. In life, we need a guide. We need a teacher, a counselor, and Jesus Christ is that for us. He tells us that, and he guides us, and he teaches us. But Jesus Christ is much more than just a teacher and a guide. He not only tells us how to live our life, but you know what? He lived the life we should have lived. And so when we mess up, when we wander away from him, when we decide not to listen to him, he says to us, I have lived the life you should have lived, and I have died the death you should have died, so that you are saved through me. When the world saw Jesus suffering and dying on the cross, nobody understood. We all wondered, God, what in the world what are you doing? And then the resurrection happened. The world didn't see that coming. You know, there will be times when it's hard to tell yourself that God cares for you, that he loves you, that he's for you. There'll be times when you ask, God, do you really love me? Because I don't feel it, because I don't sense it. I'm not seeing it. And in those times when it's hard to put your left foot, right foot, left foot, seek God, seek Jesus Christ. The wisdom of God is Jesus Christ. Seek him, and you'll get wisdom. 
Press deep into your hearts that God is all loving and all faithful and totally committed to you. All you have to do is look at Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who is to us your wisdom personified. Help us to seek him, especially in times when it's hard to walk this path of life. Give us the faith to turn our eyes to him. In Jesus Christ alone, we will stand firm. We pray this in his precious name. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Heavenly Father and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Let us sing together, bless and keep you forever.